privilege and a pleasure for me to be here at this meeting in celebration of 25 years of the biological sciences here in Zacatecas and also the commemoration of the new research and uh, teaching building. And, and I uh, do want to say to the students that I understand how important it is for you to learn to speak English and read English and also develop a strong background in biochemistry and molecular biology. And so I am very happy while I'm here to speak with any of you about science, and I'm sure my colleagues who are here with me would be likewise. All right, so uh, I'm actually from, as Jesus said, the University of Rochester, which is in upstate New York. And uh, it's a very beautiful campus. This is just part of the campus. And the city is located just south of one of the Great Lakes, Lake Ontario. And you can see it up here. This is the Genesee River. OK, so uh, as I Sue said, I am going to talk today about nonsense-mediated mRNA decay, which we abbreviate NMD. NMD primarily degrades abnormal mRNAs that prematurely terminate translation. And what I've drawn here is a picture of a generic human mRNA. It has a cap at the 5' end, a poly A tail at the 3' end. Translation initiates, as I think you all know, at an AUG initiation codon generally terminates in the last exon of the mRNA. So a premature termination codon would reside anywhere between the AUG initiation codon and the normal termination codon. NMD provides one of a number of ways by which cells control the quality of gene expression. And it does so to protect the cells from the potentially deleterious truncated proteins that would be encoded by the mRNA that prematurely terminates translation. And uh, as a quality control mechanism uh, in studying that, I noticed this cartoon that was published in one of our local newspapers. I don't know if you have Ziggy here, but Ziggy is listening to some higher voice telling him that his life may be monitored by quality control purposes, and I don't know about Ziggy, but I can tell you that our lives are monitored by quality control purposes, and the one I'm going to talk about today is NMD. So NMD reminds me of how uh, calaveras are used in this country as a way to worship and remember the dead, and uh, therefore death, and the living, and therefore life. And I've gotten some pictures of calaveras that you probably already know about. By analogy, NMD would be death, and its promise of resurrection, its uh, uh, ability to provide a protective capacity uh, would therefore be life. NMD typifies all eukaryotic organisms that have been examined, and I've made a list here of those that have been subject of most studies. These range from Saccharomyces cerevisiae, budding yeast, all the way down to ourselves, homo sapiens, also plants. And because Jesus asked me to focus on uh, talking about NMD and how it uh, relates to human disease, I'm going to focus primarily on NMD in human cells. As I've said, NMD depends on mRNA translation. Translation normally terminates at one of three nonsense codons, which are codes uh, shown here in red. These codons usually don't encode any amino acid, and they signal the release of the nascent peptide and ultimately dissociation of the two ribosomal subunits from the mRNA template. So I started to work on NMD more than 30 years ago and uh, made two fairly important findings. 
uh, by studying a number of human diseases, it became clear that uh, diseases could be due to either frame shift or nonsense mutations that result in the premature termination of translation. And the second was, if translation is sufficiently premature, then the consequence would be NMD. And uh, NMD produces a truncated protein, which can be stable and deleterious to cells. Of course, the disease is generally due to the uh, level of full-length functional protein because the mRNA that prematurely terminates translation doesn't produce full-length protein. I just want to review, since I'm talking with some of the students, it was unclear exactly what nonsense mutations, nonsense mutations and frameshift mutations are. So by way of review, here's an mRNA with the initiation codon and termination codon. And a nonsense mutation would be usually a single nucleotide change in a coding codon, so this codon, CAG, encodes an amino acid, but with the change of the C to the U, the UAG now is one of the termination codons. So this would be an example of a nonsense mutation that converts a coding codon to a nonsense codon, a premature termination codon. Frame shift mutations are insertions or deletions of a multiple of uh, other than three nucleotides, because the reading frame consists of multiples of three nucleotides. And that insertion and deletion would have to occur in the open translational reading frame. In the example here is an insertion of two nucleotides, where instead of reading GGC, CUA, it is now read GGC, CCC, and then TAG, which when read at the level of RNA, boom, this is RNA, that should be a U. Oh, it is a U. I just can't see very well from here. So um, a, a UAG is a termination codon. Con <clears throat> so there's a shift in the reading frame because of the insertion and the generation of a premature termination codon downstream of the shift. Even though we uncovered NMD by studying human diseases, the primary purpose of NMD is to downregulate abnormal transcripts that prematurely terminate translation as a consequence of routine abnormalities in gene expression. And this is because, as I've said, the resulting truncated protein, even though it can often be destabilized by the cell because it's abnormal, it can be stable enough to result in a dominant negative uh, or other, uh, it can assume a dominant negative or other function that is deleterious to cells. So NMD can be viewed as a type of mRNA quality control or mRNA surveillance. Think about the translating ribosomes surveying the mRNA during the first round of translation. Um, and if a PTC were to be found, it would result in mRNA degradation generally. And here is one example of cell, to cell toxicity that can occur when NMD fails to occur despite there being a premature termination codon. The example pertains to the human beta globin gene, which consists of three exons, and the normal termination codon, as is true for most genes, is in the last exon. Nonsense codons within the final exon of the human beta globin gene, even though they are premature termination codons, or PTCs, shown right here, do not elicit the decay of beta globin mRNA, and result in a dominantly inherited form of what is usually a recessive disease called thalassemia intermedia. So you're going to see in a moment why PTCs in the last exon do not trigger NMD. The resulting beta globin mRNA has a near normal half-life, and it turns out the truncated beta globin protein produced by it also is stable. It dimerizes with alpha globin, and this results in ineffective erythropoiesis and a dominantly inherited form of what is usually a recessive disease. And I think you all know that this is in contrast to what happens with the full-length beta globin protein, which forms a tetramer with alpha globin, a functional hemoglobin molecule, carries oxygen in the blood, and there is no anemia. So you can imagine we were very interested in understanding how cells differentiated termination codons that triggered NMD 
from those that do not. And we, in studies that generated a lot of mutations within genes, uh, insertions, deletions, moved introns around, we developed the 50 to 55 nucleotide rule. And this says that premature termination codons that reside more than 50 to 55 nucleotides upstream of the last exon exon junction of an mRNA generally trigger NMD, whereas those in the light blue region uh, that are closer than 50 to 55 nucleotides upstream of this last junction or downstream of the junction do not trigger NMD. So you can see why PTCs in the last exon of the beta globin gene, the example that I just gave you, do not trigger NMD. We don't think there's anything special about the last exon exon junction. We think that this rule pertains to any exon exon junction, whether it be the first, the second, the third, the last, whatever. It's just that if you want to look at the boundary between PTCs and an mRNA that trigger NMD and those that don't, you would look 50 to 55 nucleotides upstream of the last EJC. And I will show you why this is in a minute. As with every rule, there are exceptions. And one exception that we found is if there is a PTC and then a, the possibility of translation reinitiation at an internal methionine initiation codon between that PTC and the uh, next exon exon junction, NMD will be inhibited. All right, so uh, I want to talk about genetic conditions where NMD can modulate phenotype and this idea that NMD protects cells from the potentially deleterious effects of PTC-containing mRNAs that encode truncated proteins. Even when disease results from NMD-induced protein deficiency, the disease phenotype may be milder than and different from that caused by an expressed truncated protein. So NMD protects many heterozygous carriers of genes with PTCs from manifesting disease phenotypes that would result from expression of the truncated protein. And here's a very short list of many diseases for which these ideas pertain. I've already talked about the beta globin gene where PTCs that are five prime to the NMD boundary, they're more than 50 to 55 nucleotides upstream of the last X and X and junction in beta globin mRNA cause a recessively inherited form of beta thalassemia, and the heterozygotes are healthy. <coughs> but if there were a PTC that was three prime to the boundary that did not trigger NMD, then there would be a dominant inherited form of thalassemia called thalassemia intermedia. And I don't want to go through all of them, but let's pick one rhodopsin. So PTCs that are five prime to the boundary result to recessively inherited blindness. The heterozygotes have abnormal abnormalities on retinograms, but no clinical disease. Whereas uh, PTCs, three prime to the boundary, and this is only in one of the two alleles that this is required, result in the dominantly inherited form of the blindness. Um, just a little bit about therapies, and this was taken from a recent paper uh, written by uh, Matthias Hensa and Andreas Kolosik and colleagues. The first two therapeutic approaches that used an aminoglycoside antibiotic or a compound called PTC for post-transcriptional control, 124, have the most promise at the moment. And actually, aminoglycoside antibiotics like gentamicin have been used for a long, long time to treat kids who have cystic fibrosis or uh, either uh, Duchenne's or um, drawing a blank on what this is. Uh, two different forms, what is it? Becker, Becker muscular dystrophy. So two, two different forms of muscular dystrophy. The aminoglycoside antibiotic causes read through of a PTC and undoubtedly also a normal termination codon so that at the, at the uh, UAG, UGA, or UAA, an amino acid is incorporated instead. So there's flexibility, there's a charged amino, uh, an amino isolated tRNA that encodes uh, an amino acid that will recognize the termination codon and insert that amino acid in the growing peptide chain. You get a full length protein with a single amino acid change and if that doesn't affect activity of the protein, which often it doesn't, 
uh, there's an alleviation of disease phenotype. Generally, patients often need 1 to 5 percent of the normal level of protein uh, from that allele to feel better. But the problem is, patients can only be given the antibiotic for short periods of time because it's toxic. So, uh, and on top of that, there's a variability in response. So high doses are required, um, for, and intravenous uh, administration is required, and as a consequence of continued use, there's kidney damage and hearing loss. So it's not an ideal drug, which has driven Stu Peltz, who is CEO of a company called uh, PTC, again for post-transcriptional control. I used to think it stood for premature termination codon, but it doesn't. Um, and this also allows read-through of a premature termination codon and alleviates the disease phenotype at, in, in patients with cystic fibrosis and Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. And I know that they have finished their clinical trials, phase three clinical trials, and I don't know what the result is, but here's a drug that has fewer side effects and therefore might offer more promise. Um, these are suppressor tRNAs, I think you all know are tRNAs that uh, have an anticodon, um, a recognition of a termination codon, but are charged with an amino acid. And it's very difficult to think about introducing suppressor tRNAs into cells. So, so far, these studies have uh, used cultured cells. So when I say introduce into cells, I mean cells of patients. I know they've been injected into heart muscle, but that's not a real viable therapy. And antisense oligonucleotide has been used to uh, change splice sites so that one can actually skip the PTC-containing exon uh, or at least PTC-containing region. And sometimes uh, that uh, results in a protein with an internal deletion that has pretty good activity. And inhibitors of NMD have, for the most part, gone nowhere because uh, uh, the problem is by targeting proteins that function in NMD, it turns out they often function in other metabolic processes. All right, and now I'd like to just talk about how uh, and, uh, PTCs can arise, and they can arise at many levels. They can arise at the DNA level. For example, there could be nonsense mutations that are generated. Uh, they exist in the genome, and when they uh, manifest at the level of RNA, and the RNA is translated, uh, they're they consist of PTCs and result in the premature termination of translation. Also, base pair insertions and deletions that are in the open reading frame of an mRNA uh, will shift the reading frame if they're not multiples of threes. We've already discussed that. And usually there's a PTC generated downstream of the shift. Uh, mutations at the level of DNA can lead to alterations in pre-mRNA splicing. And you can imagine if the splice site of an intron were debilitated so that intron, the corresponding intron, were not removed. The intron was in the message, made it out into the cytoplasm, and translated the likelihood of the intron containing a, a termination codon in frame with the initiation codon is quite high. And then DNA rearrangements and uh, hypermutations that typify uh, genes that give us immune diversity, like the immunoglobulin genes or T cell receptor genes. Uh, often generate PTCs. So with the flexibility of generating uh, um, uh, different types of proteins from a particular gene comes the probability of two out of three times generating a PTC that will inactivate that allele. And then there can be PTCs arising at the RNA level, transcription errors. So if you think about it, if transcription were to initiate upstream of the normal spot, then the region that is not normally transcribed could consist of an open translational reading frame. That means translation would initiate and terminate before the initiation codon oftentimes, and there are undoubtedly, since most genes have introns, going to be introns and therefore exon exon junctions downstream of the open reading frame, upstream open reading frame termination codon. Introns uh, containing pre-mRNAs that escape splicing and also escape nuclear retention. So, uh, if an intron doesn't assemble with the spliceosome, then it's generally not going to be retained in the nucleus and make it out into the cytoplasm, and of course that intron is likely to have an in-frame termination codon. Program frame shifting leading to PTCs if the ribosome fails to shift, and then uh, aberrant splicing or alternative splicing, which can lead to exon 
retention or, uh, ex or sorry, exon excision or uh, intron retention or just the use of cryptic splice sites or new splice sites due to mutations. And I actually want to focus on, I don't know how to move it, alternative splicing, not a bigger splicing. Here's one of many scenarios by which a PTC can be generated by alternative splicing. The alternative exon is red, and normally it is removed by splicing, so translation initiates and terminates normally. But if the exon were retained, NMD could arise by one of two mechanisms. The retained exon could contain a, could contain a stop codon that's in frame with the initiation codon, and that would result in NMD. Or if the retained exon was not a multiple of three nucleotides, there would be a shift in the reading frame and most likely the generation of a PTC downstream of the shift. Alternative uh, splicing can also result in NMD, as I've said, because of exon skipping, intron retention, or splicing downstream of a normal termination codon. So that if there was an exon exon junction more than 50 to 55 nucleotides downstream of the normal termination codon, that would generate uh, NMD. Turns out NMD downregulates about a third of all alternatively spliced human transcripts. So this is probably the most prevalent way by which PTC containing mRNAs are generated. And this is a remarkable number when you think that conservatively 90, maybe even 95% of our genes encode pre-mRNAs that undergo alternative splicing. So we have very few genes. We have 20,000 genes. How do we develop our complexity during development? And as organisms with many types of different cells, it turns out that uh, many proteins come from a single gene, often regulated in a temporal, developmental, cell type specific way because of alternative splicing. But it turns out that most of these targets that uh, alternatively spliced mRNAs that contain a PTC are not productive. And this is work that came from our collaborating with Ben Blenko at the University of Toronto, and I'll give you just two reasons why we think they're not productive. First of all, the level of these PTC-containing PTC NMD <coughs> targets is usually too low to affect cellular metabolism, and also they're rarely expressed in a tissue-specific way, which is a hallmark for productive alternative splicing to generate useful isoforms to cells. Some alternative splicing events exploit NMD for post-transcriptional regulation in a process that's called RUST, Regulated Unproductive Splicing in Translation, or Alternative Splicing Linked to NMD. And this derives mainly from these labs here. So this type of regulation is important for a number of splicing regulators, including serine, uh, arginine-rich proteins, and HNRNP proteins, and it indicates that important feedback mechanisms exist to regulate splicing. And I want to give you an example of this, and that is the example provided by polypyrimidine tract binding protein. So this is a splicing factor. And its pre-mRNA consists of these exons. Normally, exon 11 is retained in the mRNA, and this produces a full-length functional PTB protein. But when intracellular levels of PTB become too high in a way that is not good for the cell, then PTB will actually, being a splicing factor, feed back on the pathway by which its own pre-mRNA is spliced, results in the skipping of exon 11. This results in a shift of the reading frame, generation of a PTC downstream of the shift in exon 11, and uh, the, the NMD because the, uh, the um, there's no full length PTB produced. So this is a way for PTB to auto-regulate its own level in a way that's constructive to the cell by affecting the splicing pattern of its own pre-mRNA utilizing NMD. So also, NMD in mammalian cells targets many physiological mRNAs. So it does function beyond the role it plays in quality control and I'd like to give some examples. So there are mRNAs that naturally contain upstream open reading frames, and I'm going to give an example of that later, but these mRNAs are targeted for NMD. 
mRNAs that naturally contain one or more introns within their 3' translator region, if that intron leaves an X and X junction that is uh, far enough away from the normal termination codon to trigger an MD. Interestingly, selenoprotein mRNAs are natural NMD targets. So we studied glutathione peroxidase 1 mRNA, which encodes uh, a selenocysteine-containing uh, protein. Selenocysteine-containing proteins contain UGA codons that incorporate, incorporate the 21st amino acid selenocysteine because they have a selenocysteine insertion element in their 3' and translator region, a specialized element. Interestingly, these mRNAs are also, to some extent, degraded by NMD. The higher the intracellular selenium concentration, the more selenocysteine incorporation, but it doesn't matter how much selenium we fed a rat, there was always some level of NMD for these mRNAs. Uh, mRNAs with transposons are pseudogenes. Some pseudogenes uh, derived from intron-containing genes still have the introns, but their open reading frame because they haven't been selected for being functional, has diverged, and there's in-frame PTCs. And then mRNAs, at least artificially, with a long 3' UTR, can also uh, trigger NMD, and I'll explain that a little bit more later. So now I want to focus on three incompletely answered questions and give you some insight into how much we know to date. And the first question is, what's the basis for the 50 to 55 nucleotide rule that I've already told you about that defines which termination codons trigger NMD. Um, and evidence indicates that human mRNAs become NMD substrates depending upon the composition of the mRNP, depending upon what proteins are bound both upstream and downstream of the termination codon. And in order for that to become clear, I need to talk about three terms. One is the exon junction complex, which we abbreviate EJC. The other is the pioneer round of translation. And the third is a surf complex. And I will describe them in more detail as I go. I think you'll all recognize, uh, you also heard from Luis, uh, what are some of the uh, steps in the expression of, in this case, mammalian genes that encode protein. You know, the DNA is transcribed in the nucleus in a collinear fashion to produce a pre-mRNA. And that pre-mRNA is processed both co- and post-transcriptionally, so the resulting mRNA looks like this. It has a cap at the 5' end, a poly A tail with its associated poly A binding protein. It also has a cat binding protein I'll tell you about in a minute. And uh, the introns have been removed by splicing. Then this mRNP is exported to the cytoplasm, and that is where it is translated and degraded. Our studies of NMD have uncovered remarkable links between pre-mRNA splicing in the nucleus and mRNA translation and degradation in the cytoplasm. And we know from work that was done by postdoc Avery Lair when he was in the lab, in collaboration with Melissa Moore, who at the time was at Brandeis, that these links are provided by exon junction complexes of proteins, or EJCs, that are deposited upstream of the exon exon junctions of newly synthesized mRNAs. And they stably contain some of the NMD factors that we and Jones Lab named after their orthologue in Saccharomyces cerevisiae called UPF, UPF factors. And uh, another postdoc in the lab, Yasu Shigaki, uh, described a new template for protein synthesis that we call the Pioneer Translation Initiation Complex. It turns out that NMD in human cells occurs as a consequence of nonsense codon recognition, PTC recognition, during a pioneer round of translation. This is the first round of translation. It utilizes newly synthesized mRNA that has yet to lose the cap binding protein heterodimer that's called CBP80 and CBP20 that's acquired actually co-transcriptionally by pre-mRNA. And then if the mRNA underwent splicing, the pioneer translation initiation complex will also contain the post-splicing BJC. So here is a model that helps to explain the 50 to 55 nucleotide rule. You already know in the nucleus, splicing deposits the EJC, and we know it's about 20 to 24 nucleotides upstream of the exon-exon junction. We think every exon-exon junction. And then uh, the first of the UPF factors to join the EJC is called UPF3, 
or 3x, and uh, John Stifus lab calls them A or B. Uh, we call them this because we map the gene for 3x to the X chromosome. This is a mostly shuttling, both are mostly shuttling, um, are mostly nuclear but shuttling proteins. They go out with a newly sized, synthesized mRNP into the cytoplasm where another energy factor that's mostly cytoplasmic joins, it's called media 2 And then if translation terminates more than 50 to 55 nucleotides upstream of an X and X injunction that has the EJC, another NMD factor, a key NMD factor called UPF1 joins, and there is NMD. So NMD can be simply boiled down to the activation of UPF1 at an EJC when translation terminates sufficiently upstream of the EJC. So the terminating ribosome doesn't physically remove the EJC. If the uh, ribosome were to get any closer than 50 to 55 nucleotides, to the X and X junction, then the terminating ribosome would remove the EJC. So that explains the 50 to 55 nucleotide rule. Let's just review what UPF1 is, the key NMD factor. Uh, it's a key factor along with UPF2 and UPF3, and I've already told you uh, the two UPF3 variants are either 3A or uh, UPF3 or 3X or UPF3B. UPF1 is an ATP-dependent RNA helicase. It's primarily hypophosphorylated in cells, and that's an important thing to remember. It's the last of the UPF factors to join in EJC, and it's thought to join when translation terminates sufficiently upstream of the EJC. Interestingly, it, it becomes hyperphosphorylated when it joins the EJC. And at that point, SMUG1, uh, HIP-related protein kinase also joins the EJC with UPF1 and phosphorylates UPF1. So what's the molecular basis of NMD? And in order for me to go into that, uh, I need to describe the SURF complex. Maybe you recognize eukaryotic release factor 1, eukaryotic release factor 3 to be the termination factors. They recognize premature termination codons, and normal termination codons. But when a premature termination codon is recognized by these two factors, SMUG1, the kinase, and UPF1, the target for the kinase, the key NMD factor, also join to form what's called the SURF complex. And this wasn't discovered by us, it was discovered by Shige Ono's group in Yokohama, Japan. Okay, so here's building on the previous model. So, you know that UPF2 joins the EJC in the cytoplasm and that uh, the pioneer round of translation occurs. So here's the EDS initiating ribosome. And if there is a PTC sufficiently upstream of an EJC so that the ribosome doesn't remove the EJC, then the SURF complex forms at that PTC. And it looks like the binding of SMUG1 and UPF1 to the two translation termination factors is in competition with this poly A binding protein called PABC1. SURF complex formation triggers NMD. It does so by allowing SMUG1 and UPF1 to then join the EJC, and I've already told you that SMUG1 phosphorylates UPF1, and there's decay. But it's actually more interesting than that in the sense that phospho-UPF1, before it can trigger mRNA decay, has to trigger translational repression. And so this is work that was done by Olaf Iskin when he was a postdoc in the lab. UPF1 phosphorylation triggers translational repression during NMD. I just want to summarize in a model what Olaf showed. So uh, here's phospho-UPF1 at the EJC. And what happens next is that the uh, phosphorylated UPF1 interacts directly with the two highest molecular weight subunits of the multi-subunit translation initiation factor, also called eukaryotic initiation factor, EIF, EIF3. And this EIF3 is a part of the 43S pre-initiation complex that is poised at the initiation codon of the NMD target ready to do another round of translation. 
but it is prevented from participating in a round of translation because the joining of phospho UPF1 to EIF3 prevents the large ribosomal subunit, the 60S subunit, from forming a functional 80S ribosome. So there is no further translation initiation. And also phospho UPF1 recruits the degradative activities that we know function in NMD. And these include decapping and 5' and 3' exonucleolytic activities, as well as deadenylating and 3' and 5' exonucleolytic activities. And we'll talk a little bit about those activities um, in a bit. We were really surprised when Yasu Ishigaki found that this mRNP, this mRNA associated protein, was translated. Because until then, this mRNP, the main difference being the nature of the cat binding protein was different, and this was the only MRP that was shown to be translated. And uh, this is a UK initiation for is the cat binding protein for this MRP. Fabrice Lejeune showed there's a precursor product relationship between, between the two. And I should mention that all the textbooks are correct. This MRP does produce the bulk of steady state protein. But this mRNP supports the first round of translation, the pioneer round of translation. And it's easy to see why NMD appears to be restricted to this, N this mRNP. It's got the EJCs and the associated UPF factors. By the time EIF4E replaces CVP80 and 20 at the cap, we can no longer detect the EJC. We can no longer detect the UPF protein. But it's even more interesting than that in the sense that CVP80 which is part of this MRP and not this one, plays an active role in NMD. So we knew way back in 2005 from now in Soda, now Hosoda, that UPF1 interacted directly with CBP80, the cat binding protein CBP80, and promoted the interaction of UPF1 joining with UPF2. And we thought at the time that was probably UPF1 joining UPF2 when it was associated with the EJC, but we weren't sure. And uh, before I show you data that that's in fact true, I just want to mention a few things. And that is the restriction of NMD to a pioneer run of translation appears to be particular to mammalian cells, to human cells. We've shown with Fred Sherman that both MRPs are targeted in yeast, and that's probably true for other organisms, all other organisms. But we can engineer an MRP so that both are targeted simply by uh, artificially tethering UPF1 downstream of a normal termination codon. And this overrides the need for the EJC and CDB80 because UPF1, the last of UPF factors to join the EJC, is already there. OK, so I'm just going to summarize a little bit about this paper that came out this summer, uh, primarily by Jungwoo Kang Huang, who's a postdoc in the lab. And he showed that UPF1 association with the cap binding protein CDP80 promotes NMD at two distinct steps. So here's his model. There's a weak or transient association of UPF1 with CDP80. And this promotes the joining of uh, SMUG1 and UPF1 to the two translation termination factors at a PTC to form the SERF complex. It actually physically escorts these proteins to form SERF. And after that, CVP80 escorts UPF1 and its kinase to the EJC, which you know results in UPF1 phosphorylation, translational repression, and decay. So how did he figure that out? And I want to show you some experiments pretty quickly. One way you can figure out the importance of a protein-protein interaction to, in this case, NMD, is to map the regions of each protein that are required for the interaction, and then express that region from one or the other protein and inhibit the interaction between the endogenous cellular proteins. And so uh, Jungwook mapped the region of UPF1, which if you look at its structure, it's 1,118 nucleotides. It has a cysteine histidine rich region and a helicase region. He mapped the region of UPF1 that binds CDP80 to the middle of the helicase region. And he used that region as a, as a MIC tagged protein uh, he expressed it in cells and found that, indeed, expressing this protein inhibited the co-IP of CPP80 with UPF1. It did not inhibit the co-IP of CPP80 with 
CBP20, which actually directly binds to CAP. And it also doesn't inhibit the interaction of CBP80 with a bridging initiation factor I'm not going to talk about called EIF4G or mRNA, which makes sense if it's not inhibiting the interaction of uh, CBP8 and CBP20, then it's not inhibiting the interaction of the cap binding complex with mRNA. And it, it also doesn't uh, co-IP itself with proteins that we know interact directly with UPF1, like the kinase, the release factor 3 that's part of the termination complex, UPF2, or EIF3A. So um, I want to show you a little bit of data. So this is an experiment that uses RT-PCR. I think you probably know that's a reverse transcription reaction that's coupled to the polymerase chain reaction to quantitate mRNA levels. And in this experiment, cells in culture were transfected. I want you to focus on those three red lanes, two red lanes, with either MYC or mic tag inhibitory protein from UPF1 and a test uh, plasma for NMD that encoded globin or GPX mRNA, either norm or tur, so norm or tur, and a reference plasmid that encoded MUP mRNA that allowed our analysis to be quantitative. So when you do transient transfections, you have to control the variations and transfection efficiencies in RNA recovery, and by measuring the level of MUP mRNA, we can do that. And you can see that with MYC alone, which doesn't interfere with NMD, the level of PTC-containing or, NM, or, or NMD-targeted globin-1 mRNA is 7% uh, globin mRNA, 7% of, of normal. GPX is 7% of normal. But with the inhibitory piece of UPF1, the NMD is inhibited tenfold and sixfold. So this PEP piece of UPF1 does inhibit NMD, and importantly, it can, it's an inhibitory effect can be reversed by overexpressing CBP80. So when you think you've measured something, it's really important to show that you certainly have measured something. You know the cause and effect. And this, by expressing extra CBP80, we would titrate out the inhibitory piece of UPF1 and, and restore the ability of endogenous cellular UPF1 and CBP80 to uh, interact and, and promote, promote NMD. Okay, so um, Jim Wilk had to do a bunch of control experiments to show that the, the region of UPF1 that inhibited NMD wasn't due to a block in mRNA export from the nucleus to the cytoplasm, didn't inhibit the pioneer round of translation. And, and uh, I want to explain immunoprecipitation, which is how we do a lot of our experiments. Um, and that, those are the kind of data I'm going to show you next. So um, we transiently transfect mammalian cells with test or reference plasmids, I've already talked about globin, norman, tur, mRNA encoding plasmids, and the MUP mRNA encoding plasmid. We can also transfect with effectors like the UPF1 inhibitory piece, or MYC alone. Um, we generate total nuclear or cytoplasmic fraction, and it's important to preserve RNP, so you don't want to strip the proteins from the RNA when you isolate the fractions and then clear the fractions using protein A agarose beads and then perform the IP. So the IP consists of the antibodies bound to these beads. So you get rid of anything that's going to bind to the beads per se, so everything that binds when you have the antibody bound should be binding to the antibody. And um, we use antibody to CPT80 or the other cat binding protein, EIF4E, and there has to be a control for nonspecific IP. And because these are rabbit antibodies, we often use normal rabbit serum. And then protein can be purified for Western blotting, and RNA can be purified for RT-PCR analysis. So uh, here Jim Wolf is showing, let me just show you the slide, the results, that CDP80 escorts UPF1 and its kinase to form the surf complex. So here he did an IP uh, using anti-HA to purify HA tag smug 1. So this is the kinase. And he did the IP in the presence of RNase A, which means that he would only detect proteins, it's all Western blotting, that interacted with HA smug 1 if they <coughs> persisted after cellular RNA was degraded. So we're all looking at cellular complexes. You can see HA with just MYC, not the inhibitory region of UPF1, co-IPs with UPF1, 
and the two other constituents of the surf complex, and also CPP-80, as if CPP-80 is the squirting smug one in UPF-1 to the release factors. But with the inhibitory piece of UPF-1, there's no inhibition of the amount of HA smug one interacting with UPF-1, but there is a decrease in the amount of uh, HA smug one interacting with the release factors and CBP80, which is of course the, uh, um, makes sense if CBP80 is escorting uh, UPF1 and its kinase to the release factors. And then the second step was pretty much shown the same way, where CBP80 escorts UPF1 and its kinase to the EJC complex. Again, um, in the presence of MIC and immunoprecipitating an EJC constituent called Y14, they're SMUG1 and UPF1, they're joining the EJC. No evidence for the release factors that are part of SIRF going along, just these guys go to the EJC. CBP80 is there because it's doing the escorting, and uh, these are two other constituents of the EJC. But with the inhibitory piece of UPF1, there's a decrease in the amount of SMUG1 and UPF1 joining to the EJC, no effect of other constituents of the EJC, and there's a decrease in the amount of CPP80. So this all indicates that CPP80, by interacting with UPF1, promotes the joining of UPF1 and its kinase to the EJC. And Jungwook got the same results using an inhibitory peptide of uh, CBP80 by mapping the terminal region of CBP80 to be the part that inter interacts with UPF1, exact same results. So if you would like to put something in a high quality paper, it's very important to show uh, the same thing using different experimental approaches just in case you're interpreting your results incorrectly. And um, that's what we did. And there's the model, which I've already told you about, that the interaction of UPF1 and CBP80 promotes NMD at, at least these two steps. So CBP80 is important for NMD. That explains why the pioneer round of translation is important for NMD. OK, the other thing I'd like to talk about is the relative contribution of exonucleolytic versus endonucleolytic decay pathways in NMD. And I just want to overview generic mRNA decay in eukaryotes. So there's two pathways. There's deadenylation dependent pathways where there's poly-A shortening, that's the deadenylation step. And then there can either be decapping by decapping activities, and after the cap is removed, the body of the transcript can be degraded in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction by exonucleases. Or after deadenylation, the body of the transcript can be degraded by the exosome, which is a complex of proteins that contains 3' prime and 5' prime exonuclear activity. And then there's endonucleolytic decay, which is often uh, mRNA specific and sequence specific, often but not always. So this is the, the decay of a uh, mRNA that's not targeted for NMD. And it turns out um, there's an endonucleolytic pathway that was recently described for NMD and also a deadenylation independent pathway that we knew about for a long time. So just to go back to what we know about NMD, Here's uh, SMUG1 and UPF1 joining the EJC. UPF1 becomes phosphorylated. And then at some point, either s these, are, these are factors, SMUG5 and 7 and SMUG6, that are involved in UPF1 dephosphorylation. But it seems to be that which are involved dictates the degradative pathway of the NMD target. So SMUG5 and SMUG6 seem to trigger deadenylation, independent decapping and deadenylation. And SMUG6 seems to target the mRNA for endonucleolytic cleavage. And one big question that resides in this pathway is what's the relative contributions of the two pathways? And we don't know the answer to that yet. OK, so um, I'd like to tell you a couple of more studies. And um, this is an interesting study because it was done by a graduate student, Gong and shows that uh, NMD is in competition with a related pathway that we call SMD in a way that contributes to myogenesis. So I'm just going to show you an overview of this. You already know that NMD is a quality control mechanism, but Stauffen-mediated mRNA decay, or SMD, is not. It seems to be a way to conditionally regulate the expression of genes whose mRNAs contain 
a binding site for the double-stranded RNA binding protein Stauffen 1. So the pathways are mechanistically related, as you'll see, but they serve distinct purposes. SMD was discovered by Yuki Kim when he was a postdoc in the lab. He used UPF1 as bait and he used to hybrid analysis and came up, shockingly, with Stauffen 1. And what he found is that uh, Stauffen, well I should tell you Stauffen is, is an RNA binding protein, double-stranded RNA binding protein that at the point of our finding this was best characterized in Drosophila as a protein that was involved in the transport localization and translational repression of particular mRNAs during oocyte development. Um, Oscar mRNA, you've probably heard of Prospero mRNA. They were localized to the posterior pole of the developing oocyte. <clears throat> but um, what, what Yunke showed was Stauffen binding to an mRNA 3 prime and translator region can function analogously to how an EJC functions during NMD and trigger mRNA decay when translation terminates sufficiently upstream so that the terminating ribosome doesn't physically remove the Stauffen binding. And that's because Stauffen can recruit UPF1, just like the EJC can recruit UPF1. But you know that uh, NMD is dependent upon EJCs and CBB80 promoted. SMD doesn't depend upon EJCs. It doesn't depend upon CBB80. And that's because Stauffen can recruit UPF1 directly and as you would expect of a pathway that conditionally regulates gene expression, it's not going to be limited to the pioneer round of translation, which is just a small amount of translation that occurs in the cell. It would also target steady state mRNA, which is the bulk of mRNA undergoing translation. <clears throat> so SMD and NMD, Gong found, are competitive pathways because they both use UPF1. And it turns out the same region of UPF1 that binds UPF2 binds Stauffen. And that region can't bind the two proteins simultaneously, so it functions in one or the other pathway. You can imagine if it's functioning here, the NMD pathway may be debilitated and vice versa. And that's in fact what happens. There's competition. So we studied myogenesis. We studied the differentiation of mouse C2 C12 uh, myoblasts in culture and found that uh, competition explains how the efficiency of SMD is upregulated during myogenesis. So initially we found that Stauffen abundance decreases in myogenesis and you would think a priori without any other information that the efficiency of SMD would decrease during myogenesis because the amount of Stauffen, a key protein in SMD decreases. But here's an example of why it's really important to uh, study a problem from more than one perspective, more than one experimental perspective. perspective. So um, we also found the cellular abundance of UPF2 decreases, but it decreases more. So there's actually more STAL1 relative to STAL2 during differentiation. There's a picture of the mononucleated myoblast that can be uh, differentiated in culture to multinucleated myotubes. And during that process, PAX3 mRNA abundance decreases because it's an SMD target. PAX3 mRNA codes a protein that's required to keep myoblasts in an undifferentiated state. So it's important to get rid of it. And one way the cell does this is post-transcriptionally by degrading the mRNA by SMD. And as I think you all know, post-transcriptional regulatory mechanisms are often coordinately uh, utilized with transcriptional mechanisms. So when Gong wanted to show uh, that PAX3 mRNA was targeted by SMD more effectively during the process of myogenesis, he had to measure the measure of uh, the level of PAX3 mRNA relative to PAX3 pre-mRNA, which also went down. And you can see in myoblasts, this is just an RT-PCR analysis, downregulating using siRNA, Stauffen 1 or UPF1 as expected would debilitate SMD, so the level of PAX3 mRNA normalized to its pre-mRNA went up. And because of competition by downregulating UPF2, we get more efficient SMD now, so the mRNA level relative to pre-mRNA level actually decreases. Um, as you'd expect of an SMD target, PAX3 mRNA co-IPs with HA tag STAL1, so it's binding Stauffen. And then when he looked at the levels of pre-mRNA in myoblasts compared to myo2s, 
uh, Gong saw about a three-fold difference in the level of pre-mRNA. As I said, the, the transcription levels are decreased. But if you look at the level of mRNA in myoblast and myotubes, there's much more than a three-fold difference. So on top of the DOM regulation transcriptionally, there's a, um, an increase in the efficiency of SMD. And then I was going to tell you about an mRNA that is a natural target for NMD because it has an upstream open reading frame, and that mRNA is myogenin. Myogenin is required for the production of myotubes, and therefore it makes sense being a natural NMD target to increase its levels. So its levels are increased not only transcriptionally, but by uh, increasing the mRNA half-life because the efficiency of NMD is decreased. And that just reviews what I've told you, that both SMD and NMD contribute to myogenesis and they form an interactive network of post-transcriptional regulatory mechanisms that work coordinately with transcriptional regulatory mechanisms. Okay, so um, I could stop there or I could tell you about our new unpublished work, which I think I'm going to do quickly. And this is work that was done by Gong and it's coming out, I just found out today, February 10th. So you hear it here first. This is the first time in Mexico. And, and it's an interesting story because um, Gong showed that long non-coding RNAs can transactivate SMD by duplexing with three prime UTRs, three prime uh, on translator regions, by ALU elements. So um, we were interested in what defines a Stauffen binding site. Um, very few double-stranded RNA binding sites are well characterized. And one of the natural SMD targets that we characterized encodes ADP, or vacillation factor one, which is involved in the um, budding and uncoding of vesicles in the gold chain. And in the three prime UTR, uh, along with our collaborator, Luke Degrossier, and his graduate student, Luke Furry, uh, Luke Furry right? um, we found that the SMD was a 19 base pair stem, makes sense if it's Stauffen's binding a double stranded region, with a 100 nucleotide apex. And if the apex were diluted, uh, deleted, 50% of Stauffen 1 binding was lost. If, for example, these four nucleotides were mutated, so the stem was disrupted, Stauffen binding went down to 20% of normal, it could be restored to almost 70% of normal if compensating base pair changes were made, so base pair in any of the other SMD target 3 prime TRs. And so what he found was that SMD targets are enriched in uh, ALU elements in the 3 prime UTR. 13% of putative SMD targets have an ALU element. And looking at GenBank, only 4% of general total cell mRNAs that were present in the gen bank have either one or two ALO elements. And we focused on mRNAs that have a single ALO element because the two ALO elements, inverted ALO elements, can actually base pair and result in A to I editing, which will result in nuclear retention. And you know that we're studying SMD, which is a cytoplasmic decay process. So we need the mRNA to make it to the cytoplasm. So, so what are ALU elements? They are short interspersed elements called signs. Importantly, they're unique to primates. So that, that would be chimpanzees, monkeys, you, me. They're uh, about 300 base pairs, and they're an extremely high copy number. They constitute 10% of the human genome, 1.4 million copies per genome. And for a long time, they were thought to be junk, because no one knew what they were doing functionally. They're commonly found in introns and intergenic genomic regions, and I've read that every uh, human pre-mRNA has, on average, 16 ALU elements in it, which I find remarkable. And until this work, they were known to regulate gene expression at multiple levels. For example, because they're AU-rich, they can create polyadenylation sequences, or um, people think they can create uh, splice sites, and also sites for microRNA binding. So Gong had a hypothesis that some Stauffen binding sites derived from intermolecular base pairing between an mRNA 3' UTR uh, ALU element and a partially complementary ALU element of a long non-coding RNA. So I've already talked about intramolecular 
Staufen binding sites, and now these are intermolecular Staufen binding sites. And uh, he thought a possibility for the other molecule would be uh, long non coding RNAs. And this made sense because 23% of the uh, long non coding RNAs in Leonard Lipovich's antisense non coding RNA pipeline database contained a single ALU element. And so, sure enough, Surfine mRNA, FLJ mRNA are SMD targets. And this is just the ALU element. Their ALU element is in black, and the ALU element from a long non-coding RNA is in red. And look at the complementarity. Look at the delta Gs. Pretty significant. So the model is, and it is correct, that in the cytoplasm there are mRNAs that are SMD targets, and there are long non-coding RNAs. We know they're uh, largely cytoplasmic and they're polyvalent. And they can form a duplex with the 3' UTR of an SMD target via partially complementary ALU elements. So we call this long non-coding RNA a half SBS because it's creating half of the Staufen binding site. This recruits Staufen, the double-stranded RNA binding protein, and when translation terminates sufficiently upstream, usually at the normal termination colon, but sufficiently upstream of the Staufen binding site, because Staufen can recruit UPF1, there's SMD. And I should say Staufen stabilizes these duplexes. Gong did a lot of experiments, one of which was isolating a complex of a long non-coding RNA with what we thought were uh, SMD targets that it could anneal to, base pair with. And the way he did this was he introduced uh, 12 copies of a viral sequence that has strong affinity for a viral protein that he expressed as a flag tag protein. And then Affinity purified the mRNP, and by purifying this long non-coding RNA, asked, is serpine mRNA there? Yes, it is. FLJ mRNA? Yes. UPF1 and Staufen? Yes. So we're calling these long non-coding RNAs half SBSs, and this one in particular, SBS RNA1. And there are many examples that Gong showed in this Nature paper that you'll be able to read about in a little bit. Another SMD target has a different uh, long non-coding RNA that nails to it. Um, so you'll notice for serpine and FLJ, they were regulated by the same long non-coding RNA. And it turns out that different long non-coding RNAs can regulate the same SBS, S SMD target, by interacting with the same SBS. And the delta Gs are reasonable. So here's another complex network of post-transcriptional regulatory mechanisms that are probably fine-tuning the level of mRNA just the way microRNAs do. So these long non-coding RNAs that contain ALU elements are functioning kind of like microRNAs. And we've given them names, half SBS RNA 2, 3, and 4. There's a ton of these. And I just want to give you um, one last slide, and that is just because an mRNA has an ALU element in a 3' UTR doesn't mean that it's always targeted for SMD. And the example is BAG5 mRNA that anneals to, remember, half long non-coding RNA, too? It's definitely present in the cells we're using. It definitely functions in SMD when it anneals to another mRNA. So we're testing now whether or not it anneals with BAG5 mRNA. You'd think by its delta G it would, but it doesn't trigger SMD. This shows it doesn't trigger SMD shows BAG5 mRNA does make it to the cytoplasm. It does not bind with Staufen. Uh, BAG5 mRNA is translated. So the question is, is there a molecule that's interacting with the ALU element in BAG5 3' UTR that precludes long non-coding RNA binding, or is there some inhibitory molecule that um, is otherwise uh, preventing Staufen from binding once a duplex forms? And we don't know the answer to that question. And I just want to um, acknowledge, well, I've kind of done this all along, the uh, many people in my lab who have contributed to the work over the years, and I've talked this time um, by work done by these people, and I also want to acknowledge the NIH for funding, and thank you very much for listening to me talk today.